ahead and start. So, hello. Thank you for uh, coming to Translating Success in Drupal 8, the Manhattan Associate story. I am James Rutherford. I'm Director of Client Services at Media Current, and I've been working with Drupal for about eight years. Spent the last almost five years at Media Current as a uh, developer, and then a lead developer and architect, and then finally as uh, Director of Client Services now. So uh, my role at Media Current at this point is to uh, engage with our clients, really understand what their business needs are, and make sure that uh, the projects that we're working with them are delivered on time and uh, on budget. You guys can follow me at James Rutherford on Twitter, and I tweet a lot about Drupal and about uh, client services issues, and I also tweet a lot about Boston sports. Um, so hopefully you're interested in that. So a little bit about Media Current. Uh, Media Current is a full service uh, digital agency that specializes in Drupal. We're based in Atlanta and um, have about 50 uh, plus employees, uh, ranging from a full development team to full design and theming team, as well as a digital strategy team. So uh, Media Current is going to strive to work with our clients and be that uh, full service partner that allows them to excel in any area of a project, whether it's planning and understanding how to execute a successful business strategy to actually doing the back-end development and making sure that um, you're building uh, Drupal correctly. They're also a lot of fun to work for, and we have a booth down in uh, 219 if you guys want to come by and see us. We have the uh, bags crossing thing. So uh, let's talk about our agenda. Um, as the title alludes to, this is the story of Manhattan Associates and uh, Drupal and, and them uh, implementing Drupal 8, which is a project that we're in the middle of with them right now and that should be launching uh, at the end of this week on Friday. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the backstory of how Manhattan Associates chose Drupal, um, how, they, how they went from uh, uh, working with Drupal previously to deciding to move to a Drupal 8 site for their uh, current platform and then what were the lessons learned and the challenges of actually implementing Drupal 8 at this point in the uh, beta life cycle? And then we're also going to take a deep dive into the translation component of Drupal 8. That's really one of the killer features in core, um, and it's one of the main reasons why uh, Manhattan Associates decided to move to Drupal 8, which we'll get into in a little bit. When we go to the translation component, I'm going to be handing off to Calvin from Lingotech. Uh, they are a partner of Media Currents and, and really the experts in translation in, in uh, the Drupal space. So, and then at the end, we should have time for a QA. So uh, let's go back in time to 2011. Um, Manhattan Associates had just launched a brand new Drupal 6 site, uh, fully translated in six languages, um, featured multi-domain publishing capabilities so they could have content that was translated in several languages and publish it out to like a sub-site or a brochure site. Really a great marketing tool for their team. And um, we also featured uh, CRM integration on all of their assets so that they could do custom Eloquos campaigns for different assets and publish those in different languages. So um, really, really powerful Drupal 6 site built uh, sort of right at the end of the life cycle of Drupal 6. Uh, Drupal 7 had really just launched uh, a few months before we launched this site. Um, we had a great project, great successful launch with them, and so Manhattan Associates and Media Current really entered into a long-term partnership at this point. We moved into a support phase with them and did a couple of small projects, and then um, you know, once they were ready for their internal team to support uh, Drupal, we uh, parted as friends. So and that's the history. Now let's move forward to 2014. Drupal in 2014 uh, is an incredible platform. You guys have all uh, hopefully watched the innovation in Drupal 7 and, and watched it really take over the enterprise space for open source. And um, an unfortunate side effect of Drupal 7 taking off through the stratosphere is that Drupal 6, um, really innovation in Drupal 6 kind of stopped, slowed down, and, and by 2014, um, it's really hard to do new things and solve new problems in Drupal 6 without paying a really high development cost. So. Um, just to recap, Drupal 6 was actually launched back in 2008. So uh, by 2014, um, we're almost eight years into the life cycle of Drupal 6. And uh, at the time that we were launching uh, their Drupal 6 site, the Drupal 7 community wasn't really robust enough or mature enough for us to make that decision. So Manhattan really got a great website out of it, but it was unfortunate that they got in at the very end of the life cycle of Drupal 6. So from the Manhattan's team, uh, their web team perspective, they recognize that they need to upgrade. They have a good tool set that served them for a while, but 
They want to go fully responsive. They want to serve to um, all different devices. They want improved tra translation tools, and they're you know very involved in the Drupal community. They see all these great innovations in Drupal 7, and they want to use them, but uh, they're hamstrung by um, being stuck on 6. So, you know, Manhattan is, is convinced that they're ready to upgrade. They know that they have to, but how do they choose between Drupal 7 or Drupal 8? I think that's a lot of, you know, question that maybe people in this room are asking. That might be why you're in this session or something that is being talked about at the con all the time. And that's really what we're going to try to highlight here is what are the decisions that Manhattan Associates made and, and how did MediaCurrent assist them uh, working through that due diligence in order to, to choose 8 and feel comfortable with that decision. Um, so a little bit more background. We were at uh, DrupalCon Austin last year, and Manhattan uh, usually sends their team out to DrupalCon and to conferences, and so we'd see them and catch up with them all the time. And they came out to our uh, after party and really engaged with us and said, hey guys, you know, our internal team has decided that Drupal 8 is, is what we want. You know, we, we've done some local builds, we love the infrastructure, it's amazing. Um, you guys are the Drupal experts, tell us, can we go to Drupal 8? What, what are the problems that we're going to have going to Drupal 8? Um, and, uh, you know, what do we need to do to prepare for a project in Drupal 8? And then finally, you know, the, the really big question is, when is Drupal 8 going to be released? This is a full year ago at Austin. And so here we are today, and you guys are asking, when is Drupal 8 going to be released? Everybody is kind of interested in, you know, how do we answer that question? The more important aspect of this question is, you know, for Manhattan and for Media Current to be able to move forward is, do we have to know when Drupal 8 is going to be released in order to do a successful project? We already know that Drupal 6 has reached the end of its life cycle and, and its usability for that team, so do they even have the ability to wait, even if they knew a concrete deadline, this is when 8 is coming out, can they wait that long? So we needed a plan that would allow us to move forward, uh, looking towards Drupal 8, recognizing that we wanted to build for Drupal 8, but also recognizing the reality that Drupal 8 might not be finished. Uh, you know, the, the community has committed to building Drupal 8 as a, a platform that will be done when it's done and not setting an arbitrary deadline. So uh, as we worked with Manhattan, you know, our plan was to uh, make sure that Drupal 8 core could do what we needed it to do for Manhattan, make sure that we had a good fit there because we knew from prior experience that even if uh, the Drupal 8, core, uh, sorry, even if Drupal 8 was released, the likelihood of the contrib module community being caught up to that point and actually being usable was extremely low, right? So we can plan for Drupal 8, we can move forward, but we can't be betting on a lot of uh, contributor modules to be there for us. So we took a look at Core, and we recognized that, you know, right out of the box, we get internationalization, which is the killer feature, and it's baked into 8. Um, the initiative is pretty much complete, and it's extremely powerful. We get the ability for them to do responsive theming with their own internal resources using Twig, and the ability to grow and change layouts on the site in a way that is sustainable and, and uh, solves their goal of making sure that they're responsive all the time. And then we solved that problem that they've had since they adopted Drupal 6, is that they want to be on the forefront of CMS innovation. So Drupal 8 looks like a good fit from that perspective. Now, we still have to move forward. We have to you know, do a discovery. We have to look at their architecture and, and actually come up with a proposal. But we don't know when Drupal 8's coming out. So the way that we solved that problem was to make sure that the architecture that we were working on with them, the way that we designed the IA and, and um, the solutions that we were providing could all match up in Drupal 7. So if we get to the end of this process, we have a great design, we have a great new digital strategy, we have a great new information architecture, and Drupal 8 is still eight months away, nine months away, we have the ability to say, okay, you know, it would have been nice to go to 8, there was a lot of pluses with going to 8, but it's okay if we go to 7. 7 is still going to be a robust platform and we can move forward. And they felt comfortable with that plan, um, as comfortable as we did. So we went ahead and, and uh, started a design and discovery project uh, back in May 2014. It was about two to three months. And um, you know we worked really closely with Manhattan to figure out what their Drupal 8 website is going to look like and build an architecture that could actually launch, assuming that um, 8 was ready at the, time of the, at the time that we finished discovery. It was key for us to make sure that we uh, restrained ourselves with scope. I mean, anytime you get a new toy, the idea is to solve every single problem that you've ever wanted to solve, and we can do this now, we can do that, and you know we really work together with their stakeholders to say, let's rein that in, let's make sure that we're solving your core business needs so that we don't add a lot of unnecessary risk to eight, and we actually have a timeline that's achievable. Um, and then finally, you know, as part of the discovery process, we were able to really dive in and understand, you know, what is the level of effort to get Drupal eight 
uh, ready for Manhattan? Which contrib modules are the ones that are out there? Do we actually need and how much work will it take for us to get them fully ready and, and working with this system? And uh, can we do a real estimate that will put a real price on, on this and understand the risk uh, based on our timeline and, and on the estimate? During this process, um, which stretched into November of 2014, uh, we got some great news. Drupal 8 Beta was announced in October. This is something that our team was looking forward to happening. Uh, with Drupal 8 Beta being announced, uh, we, we knew what the core feature set was going to be, uh, at least from a standpoint that APIs had pretty much gelled. There really wasn't going to be too many more core structural changes. And we really had a good idea of what Drupal 8 would look like at launch as far as what we imagined or hoped it would look like and what um, we were actually going to be launching with. And so from our point of view, um, the site that we needed to launch for uh, Manhattan Associates, we needed views, we needed internationalization, and we needed CMI to be rock solid. And um, at the time that beta was announced, those systems were far enough along for us to feel comfortable with uh, moving forward with a proposal. So uh, just to recap, we spent the last year planning and, and, and trying to find a way to make Drupal 8 work for Manhattan Associates trying to do it in a way that is um, actually, you know, not a pie in the sky endeavor in a way that has low risk and, and um, you know, allows them to be early adopters without uh, concern that, you know, we launch and the, the website falls over. So uh, we complete planning and deliver a proposal to them in early January of, of this year, which is right around the timeline that we had wanted. They had a, uh, or they have a mid-May uh, launch. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't good enough. So we had been working very closely with their web team and their marketing team and, and the people that we had these uh, long-term relationship with. And we gave them what we thought was a great proposal. But when they turned around and presented that to their leadership team, uh, the leadership team had major concerns. I mean, they, we had not done enough to let them understand, you know, why is it important to spend this much money to go to Drupal 8 right now? And how are you going to mitigate the risk? Manhattan Associates is an enterprise level software company and the idea that their new CMS was going to be based on a beta release was something that, you know, a lot of the um, leadership team was, you know, rightfully so sort of concerned about. So we had to work um, uh, immediately in order to alleviate this roadblock and, and uh, you know, sort of help justify our decision and then also do so in a way that allowed us to actually make the, the proposals uh, projected launch date, right? We couldn't sit there forever and, and try to figure out how to, how to mitigate this issue. So the first thing we did was do a cost comparison with Drupal 7. <coughs> we went through that whole exercise that we had talked about previously and gave them an estimate based on, hey, if you guys do 7 right now, this is what you're going to see, and gave them a, the ability to understand what the cost difference is between 7 and 8 at this point. Um, that took a little bit of work on both sides, obviously, to understand what the 7 aspect of it was. And then, you know, we still wanted to... Uh, reduce the budget further for Drupal 8 in order to say, if budget is really an issue right now, if you're not willing to spend this much to get to 8, what can we do to make that happen? So we uh, worked with Manhattan, cut some scope, and then we also uh, reorganized our project around an MVP with, with uh, reduced risk. So the MVP really was, what exactly do we need from core Drupal 8, and what's the minimum amount of contrib modules that we can use to get there? Uh, with the buy-in from Manhattan's team, we're able to reduce the budget to within what the leadership group felt was worthwhile on, on uh, spending on Drupal 8 and move forward. And then at the same time, we had to show, you know, what is the ROI of, of moving to Drupal 8 right now over staying on 7? One of the major factors that we talked about was, you know, do you want to pay for going through the move to Drupal 8 uh, three or four years from now? So we adopt 7 now, and um, 8 releases become stable and then becomes a center of innovation. If you're going to keep up with that innovation, do you want to switch CMSs again? And if, if that cost, um, which is hopefully reduced, right, because Drupal as a community is trying to learn from the pain of, of further migrations, but there's also the hidden cost of your organizational cost, right? If you, in three years, have to move from seven to eight, then that's the time that your CMS team and your leadership team is spending planning that instead of doing what they should be doing, which is executing on their digital strategy. So. Um, by demonstrating uh, a cost savings there and going early and um, you know, continuing to educate them on the Drupal model of how the contrib community works and, and where innovation happens in contrib, we were able to demonstrate the ROI to their leadership. And then uh, I think the hardest task that we had to do was demonstrate that we had an expert level understanding of risk, right? That's the big unknown with Drupal 8. There is so much unknown. Even in beta right now, we could see um, architectural changes that will cause your data to change or key features that you expected to be able to work with to work differently. 
So how do we understand that risk and, and provide a clear roadmap that they can feel comfortable moving forward with? Well, the very first thing we did was um, you know, do a real analysis of where Drupal 8 was. We dove into the issue queue and looked at um, you know, how many critical issues do we have right now for this beta? And what's the velocity of critical issues over time, right? If we look back in December of, of last year, there was 110 critical issues in the issue queue. We move forward to the time we're having this conversation in January, we're down to 72 critical issues. So um, you know, moving forward two weeks later, we expect that to continue. We talked about how with the APIs gelling that um, you know, uh, uh, development momentum would continue on Drupal as well. And then finally, we took a dive into those actual issues and said, what do these issues mean to your project? Um, how do they actually affect us? So of those, uh, I think you said uh, 72 issues at the time that we're having this conversation, we were able to determine that 53 of them uh, were uh, affecting the actual core components that we wanted to use in Drupal 8. And of those 53, only 22 of them were actual bugs. So as part of our proposal to them and as part of our justification, we went through that list of 22 and showed them how those were, you know, uh, we could mitigate those as part of the risk analysis that we had done. A great example is uh, a bug in the core menu system that would mean that updating menu items post-launch, if, which is a giant if, that hadn't been addressed by the time that we had to launch, you know, how would they maintain the menu? And we were able to demonstrate that their team had the programmatic expertise and a partner in Media Current that would allow them to do that through um, you know, fairly easy code deployment. So addressing each of those issues, showing that we had planned for them, and then showing them where in the budget we had estimated for those tasks instead of just saying, you know, here's a pile of money and we hope that we don't run out of it, um, I think really was what helped to sway the um, leadership team at, at Manhattan. So what does that all add up to? Uh, January 30th, I got an email from one of the key stakeholders, stakeholders at Manhattan saying, hey, we, you know, we've got the green light, we're moving forward. And I, I took a screenshot of it because it was such a great email to get, but uh, this is us finding out that we're doing our first enterprise level uh, at Drupal 8 site. So uh, next we're gonna talk about how to build an entire enterprise Drupal 8 site in three months, um, which is really could be like three or four sessions and is hopefully some of the stuff that you guys have been getting in the other sessions. So what I'm actually gonna do here is um, stay pretty high level and we can dive into some of that in the QA, but we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the leadership challenges with doing uh, enterprise Drupal 8. So we had an extremely tight uh, deadline, if you remember, we actually lost the whole first month of January uh, working with Manhattan to help them um, you know, make that internal cultural decision to bet on Drupal 8. So now we're looking at February to middle of May to execute on the project. And the way we did that was by uh, you know, continuing to leverage our partnership with Manhattan. We've been working with them for over four years. We know their team members. We know what they're capable of. Uh, they know what we're capable of. So we divided the project up into three different teams. We had one team working independently on the contrib modules that needed to be upgraded allowing them to work in a vacuum and, and really just work against what the latest beta release of Drupal 8 was. And then um, we had our other uh, media current team working on the actual site build, building out the theme, building out the uh, more complicated aspects of the configuration. And then we worked with Manhattan to have them do uh, some of the more basic uh, Drupal configuration. They found that uh, Drupal 8's UI was intuitive and they'd already been using uh, 6 for a long time, so they were able to build views and build content types and move the, uh, the data entry aspect of it forward. So we have all three of these teams working in parallel. And uh, we also, before we even got to the point where we kicked off, had done preparation. So um, Manhattan's team has been working with Drupal 8 to vet it for over a year, testing building views, testing building content types, et cetera. And uh, Media Current committed our entire development team to Drupal 8 and Symphony 2 training, which actually uh, came in handy as we move forward in the project. And then um, we talked about this throughout the whole project, but we budgeted for risk in order to say, you know, we understand as a company that there are unknowns in Drupal 8. And um, by budgeting for risk and forecasting for risk, making sure that we had team members that would be available if, um, you know, a certain aspect of the project hit trouble and we needed to scale up team members, we were prepared to do so. Um, you know, and I wanna highlight that budgeting for risk, you don't just wanna create a big bucket of money that you're hoping will cover um, you know, what are the deficiencies in the planning you have are at all. That's the recipe for disaster. What you wanna do is that due diligence and make sure that you're prepared to take the time and spend the money to do the due diligence to understand how am I utilizing Drupal 8? How does it match up with my actual business use cases? And where are the deficiencies in Drupal 8 right now that we need to mitigate? 
so because we were able to do that work, um, you know, we were able to have an appropriate budget for risk and, and move forward as things got complicated. It wasn't all, uh, you know, easy as I'm painting the picture here. Hopefully, there was a few hard lessons learned. So I'm going to stay pretty high level. But um, one of the toughest ones for us was that at, at this point in the life cycle, and I think it's probably still true right now, contributor modules are not as far along as we expected. We plan to use core as heavily as possible, but we still needed, um, you know, to target the correct uh, contrib modules and, and not um, bake in a totally custom solution that, as contrib matured, uh, uh, Manhattan would have to pay then to, to move on to these contrib solutions. So we did our due diligence, but really when we went to implement um, a lot of these contrib modules, we found that they either weren't as far along as we expected them to be or that, um, you know, if, if a Drupal 7 version of that module behaves in a way that you've expected it to behave for a long time, don't uh, bet that the Drupal 8 version will work exactly like that. We also learned that uh, Twig is not a magic bullet. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Twig is the new uh, templating layer in Drupal 8. And it's also, um, you know, used in, in several other projects. It's extremely powerful. It's, uh, um, according to the front end developers, great to work in. Um, so it's not really Twig, but Twig's integration with Drupal at this point lends itself to problems. Your expectation is that, uh, you know, all of your data with minimal effort will be there in the theming layer in order to use. And the reality is, is that you'll have to be writing bridges at this point in order to do things like to get submenus to show up in your template. So, um, you know, that was something that we expected to be a little bit easier and uh, had to mitigate as, as we moved through the project. And then finally, even with all the training that we did and even with, um, you know, an entire staff of expert Drupal developers, the ramp up speed is a factor for uh, new Drupal 8 team members. Um, or for really anybody at all that's coming into it. It's a new platform, and the fact that it's a rewrite means that you're relearning lots of convention and lots of little, you know, sort of veteran things that we already know about Drupal 7 and uh, Drupal 6 that ultimately end up slowing down that time and making it so that even with training, it's very difficult to say, hey, we've got two developers over here and we need, you know, 10 more hours in this project. Let's just throw them at it because they need that time to get up to speed. Okay, so uh, what we have is uh, a new Drupal 8 website launching for Manhattan on May 15th with an asterisk because it hasn't actually launched yet, but um, we're expecting it to launch. It's not my call whether or not it launches. It'll be Manhattan's, um, but look for that on Friday. Um, I think the big takeaway for anybody that is, you know, endeavoring to move down to Drupal 8 right now, you know, you, you can't wait to get off the block is, Make sure that you can afford to do all of that preliminary research and to match up all of your feature set with what's actually in Drupal. Uh, not from like a high level bullet point, but get in, get into the issue queue and uh, get your hands dirty and make sure that um, your expectations are correct. And then um, the other bullet point that I wanted is that even though this has uh, really been high level, you know, w one thing that our team has shared with me is that it's uh, Drupal 8's benefits, um, even with the difficulties we're having now, are pretty clear. Uh, once the developers are up to speed, they're able to develop efficiently and uh, for the most part are enjoying working in uh, the new framework. The same with the theme layer. The translation functionality is, uh, you know, another leap year ahead of Drupal 7, which already has incredibly robust translation. So we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. And um, the improved UI and editorial experience is something that uh, Manhattan has been very happy with. So. Okay, thanks. So Kevin, you want to jump in? How's everybody doing today? Good. How many people here have uh, translation needs or they do translation on their websites? Everybody, oh good. And everybody's in seven or six, six, seven? Seven? And you guys are looking to move towards eight at some, some point? Great. Well, we're excited. Let me just give you kind of a high level. Um, I'm from uh, Lingatech. Oh, hold on. Uh, Lingotech, we call ourselves the Translation Network. Um, I'm going to go through these slides really quickly, but um, I'm going to show you the power to translate is now inside of Drupal. Um, Drupal actually, Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 are, have great multilingual functionality um, baked into the core and contrib modules. Um, it, I'll start out by, you know, giving some problems and solutions that we help solve um, and uh, 
also show what the differences are between D7 and D8 are. Um, we appreciate uh, James and his team, Media Current, uh, great partners of ours. I uh, appreciate them allowing to take some time here to, to describe some of this stuff today. Uh, so I'm going to just talk about today's challenges with multilingual websites. Um, I'm going to show you a flexible, agile solution that's inside of, of uh, Drupal. Um, we'll take a high-level tour of how it works uh, currently in 7, um, and then an installation setup, just some quick work workflows. And then we're going to take a closer look at D7 and D8 and what the differences are and why we're excited to see D8 come out. Um, and part of the reason, or a big part of the reason, these guys decided to go with D8. We'll do some Q&A. So the problem that we have um, is that uh, you know today's websites are highly dynamic, um, and it has a, a continuous life cycle of change. So you're always updating with different types of content and, and whatnot. And the legacy process for translating, sorry, that's really kind of hard to see, uh, is uh, is lacks up in speed and agility. So it's really hard to translate stuff. So currently, a lot of people are copying, pasting stuff out, and having to send it over to a translator. Or they're hooking into you know Google Translate to do some translation, and it's just kind of challenging. And so you have this uh, legacy translation pro process. And so why is it? Uh, what are what are we trying to solve here? So if you look at a typical project, and this is just the translation piece of it. Um, you have some project manager stuff and some web administrator stuff, but you have to identify content, new pages, edit pages, um, you know, download the pages, export them as either PO files or XLIF or something like that. And most translation uh, companies that you talk to uh, only do one box of this. And so you have all of these steps and the translation agency, or what's called the language service provider, is only going to do the translation part of this. And so what our software does is it starts to take, you know, parts of the system um, and, well, actually, when we go back into this, when you tie this by how many languages, number of pages, you know, words per page, you know, how, how evolved the process is, time zones, steps in the process, uh, it starts to get kind of unwieldy. And so, you know, even ourselves, we have a 500-page website. We're in 10 languages. That makes 5,000 pages. So it's a lot of content, right, that you have to keep track of and, and, and position. So it's inefficient man hours available to keep up with the pace of the change um, and how and the volume that you're looking at. So there's too many steps if it's manual just to even keep track of. I mean we have a lot of clients you see they're taking care of this stuff in, in spreadsheets and and Google Docs and that kind of stuff. It's just kind of crazy. There's not enough automation um, in the process. And so what we do is we provide a, a flexible solution that allows you to automate uh, for managing all these uh, workflows and saves you time, money, mistakes, um, and uh, and makes the process much quicker. So how does it work? Um, in our particular case, we have uh, your content on your website in Drupal. We have a, a module, LinguaTech module, that you can download on Drupal.org um, that uh, identifies uh, or helps identify the content you want to translate. That stuff is pushed up into our translation, um, our cloud-based translation network. Um, you can run through different workflows, and I'll go through workflows here in just a minute. And then when those are done, it's published back into uh, into Drupal. Um, we're not replacing the core functionality of Drupal. Drupal and all of the contrib modules in 7 and in 8 are really the plumbing to make your site multilingual. What we do is help to translate that content, like how do you actually get the content out and translate it and, and replace that, that back into, into the system. So not all, all content is the same. Um, so some people say, oh, I have to professionally translate or I don't. Um, we actually have what we call a content value index where you can actually do different levels of translation. So some translation or some content may only be machine translated. It's super inexpensive to do that. It's like 0.03 cents a word, basically. You can do community or crowdsource translation. So if you have in-country marketing managers or folks that uh, can help you translate, um, you can actually have them log into the system and do the translation. In some cases, you need professional translation or, and review. So there's just consider these all workflows, and you can actually do a different combination of these. Some people will actually do machine translation, and then they'll do a post-edit of it by a professional or community member. Um, our system is also flexible enough that you can do it based on languages. So one language might go through one workflow, another language might go through another workflow, which is really handy, um, especially when you have like 10 languages, and a lot of times you have 10 different locations that each have their own offices and they kind of want to control content or at least have a, a say in that. So that's helpful for that as well. So all of these pieces that you saw in this earlier thing are handled actually by uh, the, the module. So we automate the process of mailing the files or you know, FTPing or emailing files around 
and, and whatnot. So all of these steps actually are handled inside of the Drupal site, inside of the module. And then the translation process is handled by the translation management system, and again, those different workflows. Um, and then the rest of these pieces are handled by the translation management system itself. And so what we're eliminating is not the actual translation itself, you know, word by word, but we're actually eliminating all of this, this project management or webmaster stuff around translation that makes it very complicated. So as you can see, if you can start to eliminate a lot of these steps um, and all of them are handled in the system, then it makes translation a lot easier. So that's what we're trying to do. So I'm going to do a quick tour um, of the product itself. Um, and this is just the power of translators inside of, of uh, Drupal. It's super easy to install. Um, we recommend if you're going to install it to use a Drush command. Um, there are dependencies uh, that make, in particular this is D7, make it multilingual. Um, so the Drush command will actually install all those dependencies. Um, if you've ever tried to install a, or create a multilingual website in D7, it can be challenging because there's about five or six contrib modules that you have to turn on in a certain order and turn on certain content types and that kind of stuff. Um, we automate all of that in the install process, so it makes it super easy to do. So when you have the modules in, you can go in and just enable uh, the Lingotech module. Uh, you create an account, which is the account that sends the content up to our translation management system, just basic information. Um, you can do your source language, which is, in this case, we're showing in English. And this is actually a commerce kickstart um, distribution that we're inside of. Once you get inside, you have a translation uh, dashboard that shows your content, um, what, how much of it's been translated. If you can see these, you know, there's different languages. You can add languages. You can sync translations. Um, it gives you a really robust way of seeing what is and is not in sync um, in this kind of dashboard of you. Uh, it's actually very easy to tell. Um, if content is translated and you make a change on a page um, and you retranslate that page, you only have to translate the changes because we keep track of those in translation memories. Um, anyway, it makes it super easy. Sync the translations. Um, in this case, we're going to um, just translate the entire website into machine translation. This is an example on this. This is really handy just to get an idea of what a, uh, your site looks like in a different language. Um, like I said, we don't necessarily recommend doing all machine translation, but uh, you can do the machine translation and it certainly can show you if your menus get translated and, and all of that um, and, and where you need to, to, to work on uh, different pieces of the product. Once the translation happens, of course, you have this kind of drop down to different languages and you can do a language switch or whatever you want. Um, but you now have this English site um, has now been translated into a machine translated site. So it's really that simple. You can, you know, a five, ten page site or a 50 page site can be machine translate, translated in like five or ten minutes. Um, it's, it's actually pretty fun to watch because it seems like it's almost like magic because the whole thing will translate the menus and everything. Um, they've done a great job. Now, if you want to go into um, uh, into editing, um, you can, you know, send different translation engines. We hook into different machine machine translation engines if you want to use those. So we hook into like Google and Microsoft, and there's a variety of paid machine translation engines um, as part of that. Now you have all these settings. I'm showing you, this, you know, really quickly, but there's, you know, all these settings where you can synchronize stuff. You can include source text automatically, send stuff up for translation. You can do it manually or automatic. Um, you can pick different uh, uh, different engines. You can decide to translate your URLs if you're using um, uh, uh, Switcher on that. Um, but anyway, so uh, you know, switch the page. Um, you can also do what we call community or crowdsource translation, or this might be someone that's an in-country marketing manager. Um, this is someone obviously that's logged in, and they do have permissions to see this and do the editing. But we do a, a, a box here that says, you know, this page has been machine translated. And someone can click on the link, and it actually brings up the Lingotech workbench that allows them to do a translation. So this is a post-edit of machine translation, and, and you can use that with, you know, your crowd or, or uh, folks that you are on your team. Once they do the translation and they click save and continue, um, that page is automatically API back down, and the translations are now live. Now, all translations are stored inside of Drupal. Um, and we do that for indexing and for search purposes. I mean, obviously for SEO and that, you want to make sure that those are there. So, you know, the, the, it's not like a, um, a proxy-based server where stuff is stored in the, on someone else's server and is not indexable. So think of uh, Drupal sites are, s you know, highly dynamic pages come up with different content based on who's logged in, um, and, and that's all served up from Drupal. And we don't replace that functionality at all. 
Now, if you want to do professional translation, um, this is actually where we start to make money. Our, our module's free to download um, and free to use. We get free machine translation just so you can try it out. So I, I recommend you just check it out to see how it works for you. We also do professional translation that's based on the content type and words and languages. Um, so you can click on professional translation. We give you an estimate based on good, better, best uh, quality of translation and, and give you an estimate you can pay for it and, and have that professionally translated. So that's actually how we make the money. Once the translation's done, then the site, again, API's back and you have, and you have that uh, translation. So I'm gonna jump into what the difference are between D7 and, and D8 are. Um, the Drupal 7 language, uh, Drupal 7 uh, landscape had a, a lot of, there's a lot of trouble spots and most of it's been kind of patched and worked around. Um, there were many things that were not translatable in core and English was not the only true source language. So in, in D8, you actually pick your core language when you start. So in, in D7, it assumes everybody's English and, and starts in English and you can change it, but when you first start, you have to start in English. So um, that gets fixed in there. But when you look at the actual landscape, um, you have this huge graph of all of the different dependencies to have uh, D7 work out. Um, green ones are in the core, and then there's contributed modules. Uh, I know these are too small to, to, to look at, and this is not by any means a representation of everything. But there's just a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of relationships in, in that. Um, now, with that being said, D7 is actually still a really good translation in multilingual CMS. It's, we deal with a lot of different ones as a company and it actually does handle, as, as, as messy as this may look, it actually handles it better than most content management systems. So um, D7 taxonomy translation, we have the I18N versus entity translation. Um, both are young, both are active and who wins? So you have to pick which direction you're gonna do um, in your translation. Um, some have pluses and some have minuses and you can ask those in the Q&A and I can, I can have my developer give a little more explanation of which, which is which. But if you pick one and then you wanna change it, it's really difficult to change in mid process. And so you really have to kind of know what you're going to do. Um, menu translations um, is a source of a lot of headaches. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to set up. Um, and you know, you have this language neutral, when do you use it, when do you not use it? A lot of times I just ignore it in certain circumstances and whatnot. So you really have to start to understand and do a lot of research to figure out which of these, which of these you want to use. So field collections is always a, a favorite of folks to do. It's easy to, you know, fun to set up. It's easy to work with, but it's not uh, very friendly with translation. Um, and it's very fragile. And so we have to do actually quite a bit of work around in our module to work through those issues. Um, and field collections is not, uh, maintained very robustly. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's th there's a lot of people use it, but not a lot of uh, time is spent in fixing bugs and stuff in there. So we have a lot of uh, workarounds for that um, in, in there. So the easiest way to get uh, uh, and make your Drupal 7 multilingual ready is to use our, our translation, um, the thing check translation. And like I said, use the following commands. It's at this project. Even if you don't use Lingo Attack, I would suggest <laughs> using us to set it up because it'll set up all the dependencies automatically through a through command line. Um, it'll save hours and, and a lot of headache to figure out what uh, what things you have to turn on and off. Uh, there's books written about it, you know, that are 150 pages on how to get this set up and we can solve all of that. You can have it all set up in like five minutes. So use that just to get, make your site multilingual ready and of course you can certainly try us out and use the free ma machine translation. So let's talk a little bit about the Drupal 8 uh, landscape. Uh, really quickly. So D8 is a huge multilingual effort. It's uh, one of the, is it six main core pieces in it? There's, there's four, right, four. Um, and uh, language interface, the content, and the, conf the configure, the ones that are, we're looking at um, as the, the main part parts of, of that. Um, and they've spent a lot of time and effort. Um, obviously, you know, as, as Dries, uh, is international. I think that's kind of core his heart. It was interesting to see this morning. I think you know internationalization was in 2.0 or 3.0, and it was one of the very first things that they've done. So it's been a core, you know, what they've looked at, and obviously, eight they want to take it uh, even more deeply. Um, so what's interesting is when you open up Drupal, you actually pick a base language. Um, and if you guys, if anyone's downloaded D8 and started to play with it, you'll start to see some of this stuff. 
but there's no longer this sense that it's in English and we're going to, and, and everything's going to be translated. You pick the core, and then once the core is started, uh, it's now in that language. Now, that's a fundamental shift to say now everything is in this particular language, and we're going to start from this point. It also makes some interesting connections where you're translating stuff because in the United States, we have a tendency to say everything's in English when we're going to translate into another language. And actually, there's a lot of other languages that now want to translate into English. So I might have a French site that now I actually want to translate into English or a Japanese that I want to translate into English. This makes that easier for that to happen. Um, the, in the translation interface um, has uh, uh, the ability to set up uh, account settings, site information, um, titles and descriptions on the buttons and that. Um, you can go into uh, translations of chimps and chumps. Is that your last <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it makes it, uh, which is based on uh, entity translation in D7. Uh, configuration, all of these um, configurations ha have been standardized. So remember in, in D7, um, you could translate taxonomy terms in two different ways, and now it's all done one way. So that's all been combined to IATN and, and uh, entity translation more clearly defined, lines, of, lines have been drawn. So the difference between Drupal 8, IATN, and Entity Translation, um, those are both contrib modules, IATN or Entity Translation, they're now part of core. And so you actually have people that are maintaining it at, at, the, at the core level as opposed to uh, a side project for folks. So what is the winner? The winner is all of this. So we've gone from D7, which has all of these different dependencies in this kind of structure to you know a very clean and, and Easy, easy interface. Now, again, LingoTech sits on front of this. This is the D8 is the plumbing again for multilingual translation, and, and uh, LingoTech is the the means of translating that content. So people come up to us and say, "Are you going to go out of business when D when D8 comes out?" And actually, no, we're not. It you know it actually expands it, and makes it more prevalent in the community, and it's a it's a bigger thing in a more internationalized market. So. Just from our point in LingoTech, we actually do have a D6, 7, and uh, 8 version. We are in dev version and support, I think, up to beta of 6 or 7, uh, 10. We got to 10. Um, and we're going to have, you know, when D8 comes out, we'll be 100% compatible and feature com uh, compar uh, parity to uh, D7. Um, so we do have that as a company that's committed towards that as well. And here's my, uh, here's my contact information. Um, if you want to know more about Lingotech, lingotech.com slash Drupal, you can go to drupal.org um, project, the slash project slash uh, Drupal and uh, download six, seven, or eight on there. Um, but we're very encouraged by uh, the response we've had at this uh, conference and, and people coming by, and they're both of our booths, and, um, and asking about uh, D8 and translation as well. So, got some time for some questions? From either side here. One question. Yeah, there's a microphone. You can go because they're recording all of this. If you have a question, you can go up and, and ask that. Uh, so, were there any pain points uh, in content migration from D6 to D8 when that happened? I'm in the position of um, trying to convince my boss who makes all the decisions to go with Drupal rather than some of the other content management systems out there. And I was wondering if you guys, uh, particularly with Manhattan, had explored any of the other CMSs or were you pretty much, they were sold on Drupal, you were sold on Drupal and it was just seven or eight. And if, um, even if not, like, is there any, takeaway that I can
bring back and say, this is why we really need to go with Drupal um, rather than WordPress. Or yeah, yeah. Um, so fortunately for us, we didn't have to make an argument against another content management system. Even though um, you know we had to do a lot of work to uh, justify our proposal to the leadership at, at Manhattan, um, which makes sense. I mean, it's the same thing you're going through now. We had the buy-in from the core team that Drupal and from the leadership team that Drupal was the right way to go, regardless of whether or not it was seven or eight. It was really just justifying that, um, you know, making the, the jump to eight early because of their deadline, they had to go to a new platform, uh, was the right way to move. So it was fortunate for us that we didn't have to really deal with that question, but if I'm in your shoes, I mean, I think that the absolute killer is that uh, Drupal 8's core uh, integration, as opposed to it just being a module, is, uh, is what differentiates it from the rest of the open source uh, community by the fact that every single API and every single aspect of core takes um, the idea of translation as part of its fundamental step, uh, I think makes it you know an entire class above other open source CMSs. Yeah, certainly other open source CMSs have um, you know a little bit of the D7 problem where you have to have extra modules or plugins to make the plumbing work, so to speak. Um, in WordPress, for example, you, s you, s you know, WordPress out of the bo out of the box is not multilingual ready, and so in that case, you have to decide whether you're going to do multi-site or you're going to get a third-party plugin to to do the plumbing piece on that. And then there's a whole security issue that comes along with with WordPress. There's a lot more security holes and issues along that. If multilingual is the is the you kind of the gating factor. Um, we deal with lots and lots of different content management systems, and Drupal, even Drupal 7, handles it better than most, if not all, um, on the market right now. So and we'd be happy to help you make that case with your, with your boss if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I think you either said this or implied that there was um, some sort of a system that we would – so if I, if I have a website and it's in five different languages and – things all translated and suddenly I decide I need to change I need to change the content on a given thing is there a subsequent like I can uh, for for every other page or node with that content in a different language is there like a revision that's automatically created with a notation for what needs to be translated subject to uh, you know translation and then publication of that node I'm just wondering how that if, if there's like a you know sort of waterfall effect where I've got my site in place. I mean, I've, I've, I've you know developed multilingual sites, and it's like once once you publish the page, everything is completely independent. If you you know if I change the content on one page, I just have to know that I have to go to the other page and change the content. You know, so I'm not is there some sort of system that lets you know that it has to be done for the other uh, translated pages? So, um, Colin, do you want to take that from a platform perspective? Yeah, so in our platform, so our, our translation management system, and I, I, t I mentioned this, and I didn't go into too much detail because of time, but the, the benefit of using a translation management system is what we call translation memories. And translation memories are previously translated content that has been approved by a human. So it could be machine translated and then someone post-edited it, and they've said this is the correct, you know, sentence so to speak. When that is stored in a memory, uh, that becomes a, a kind of the corpus for that particular content. On a page, you say you have five paragraphs and you've written the content and you've sent it off and it's been translated, and a week later you change one paragraph or one sentence. You can resend that content back up to Lingotech for translation and we match it against the translation memory and we only have the differences translated. Now, we call that content reuse and recycle, so you can reuse that content um, over and over again. What that means is you don't have to pay for that content, all of the content to be retranslated, only the new piece, or, or have someone do the post-editing on it. If you have content that's similar on page to page, that actually gets picked up too, because it's not just the page. You can match against any page in your site. And so most marketing sites, support sites, um, knowledge bases have similar content in them, right? Same writers are writing them or they're copying and pasting one to the other. If the translation memory has been set, 
you can run any page against that translation memory and the differences are, are kept. Now in the, in the old days, you know, in before we were using a translation management system, you would have to keep track of the change. So you would say, here's the page, I've made a change, and, and then you know, put that in some sort of a spreadsheet and then send it to the translator. And then when it came back, you would have to either replace the content of the entire page into the page, or you'd have to remember which sentence it is, and maybe it's a different language, you don't know how or where to place it. All of that is eliminated. So when you see all those steps in the boxes, and you say, oh, how am I eliminating? That's what the, the, the system does, is it programmatically keeps track of all of that stuff and that, those changes. That's really where you save the time and money. So we have clients that you know, will save 25% in translation costs because of memories and, and using the system, but they actually can translate 50% faster because of these changes. And so if you're going to market with a product and you can go 50% earlier than you were planning to, you can see the, the kind of the benefits of that. Does that answer your question? It's, it's a good. That's a good question, and that's a big benefit of what we do. Uh, with the web connecting people from all over the world and people being able to come to sites and discovery and all that stuff, is uh, is multilingual something that maybe a current pushes to your clients, prospective clients, not just from a localization perspective, but also from an accessibility point of view in terms of making the web accessible. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I hate, I don't like the term push. Uh, that's, that's something that we, we, we try not to push anything onto any clients. It's really, um, you know, uh, speaking strictly from a media current perspective, we have uh, processes that we like to work through with clients so that essentially what we're doing is becoming a partner with you, right? So what that means is we're trying to understand what your business problems are, why you're trying to achieve your goals, so that any solution that we're recommending or working with you on um, really shouldn't feel like a push, right? It should feel like a natural fit. If we have a client that um, we feel would benefit from internationalization um, because of their goals, their digital strategy, their potential market, then we're going to try to demonstrate them why, why this would be a great move for you as a company. And here's how we can do it, uh, you know, fairly painlessly for you to move forward. Um, if we feel like it doesn't fit, uh, not because they wouldn't have gained some benefits from translation, but because it doesn't match the budget that they have currently, or they have bigger issues that um, the budget they have would probably, you know, be better off suiting them. Then, in that case, we'll, you know, kind of mention it as this would be an advantage for you, but um, probably something that we should go in the backlog if we type deprioritize. and your risk management, were you uh, able to look outside the company if you needed the additional resources, if you hit a particular problem with Drupal 8, were you able to find resources that could help you? Or was that putting more internal resources into getting your own people up to speed even faster? Or, you know, How did you manage that risk in getting additional resources? Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so we didn't um, plan on, on working with a partner. Um, certainly, that would have been something that, uh, you know, had the timeline called for that and had our own in internal forecasting made us realize, you know, we know that we need to have these personnel and we know that, um, you know, we just, we're not going to be able to have it if we get to that point where uh, risk becomes reality and, and we need to ramp up. If people aren't going to be there, then that's something that we probably would have considered or at least, you know, discussed with Manhattan. But, um, you know, from a forecasting perspective, we, we felt like we kept the resources that we need and that we prepared the resources that we need in order to be able to flex. So I think it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, right? It's always hard to see where you're going to be at any point in time. And yeah. So I think we have about time for one more question, if anybody has one more. Bob, you got a question? <laughs> All right, well, if there are no more questions, um, I appreciate your guys' time today. I uh, appreciate James and Media Current. And I uh, appreciate everyone coming to the session. Tech, like, everybody works and everybody loves it. Uh, doing <laughs> <laughs> this thing's yeah. We're, do we're doing an after party tonight at City Tavern, so uh, it it's a partnership between uh, uh, 
media current and Lingotech. So come out and hang out with us, and, and we'll talk translation all night if you guys have more <laughs> questions. <so. laughs> well, that's it. Uh, it's from 8 to 11. It's at uh, City Tavern. It's about four blocks from here. Just Thanks, guys. Okay.